Hey everybody, I'm Pastor Jeff Durbin with Apologia Church. I want to thank you all so much for watching the content right here on Apologia Studios channel. Uh, what you're about to watch is a sermon, a message from Apologia Church's worship service. And again, I want to thank you all so much for watching, for liking, for commenting, for sharing the sermon itself. We truly believe that it's important for the Christian church to have an engagement in the public square with the Word of God. So we thank you so much for partnering with us to send this out across the world. I just wanted to say something before you actually watch this and that is that uh, I'm not your pastor um, though I'd love to be I am not your pastor and um, it's very important as you're watching this you know that it's God's design for individual Christians to be part of a local Christian church under the care of qualified faithful biblical elders and so as much as we love all of you watching these sermons and we're thankful to God that God uses them to bless you to encourage you I do want to encourage you as a minister of the gospel to get plugged into a local body of believers, particularly, I think, important, uh, a reformed church would be, would be best, but we want to encourage you to get plugged into a solid biblical church where you can fellowship, where you can worship, where you can serve, where you can be connected. That is vitally important and actually a biblical command. And so as much as, again, as we love for your participation, your partnership, and we are so thankful to God that he's using these in your lives, we want to encourage you to get plugged into a local church. You can, though, actually partner with Apologia Church as we proclaim the gospel and provide a defense of the biblical gospel all around the world. You can do that by going to ApologiaStudios.com. You can partner with us by becoming All Access. When you do, you help to make all of this possible and you get all of our TV shows, our after shows, and Apologia Academy. All of that, and you're a part of all that God is doing with us in the world to proclaim, herald the gospel of the kingdom. You can partner with us, and I want to say one last word about that. Do make sure that none of your giving and partnership towards Apologia Church interferes with your giving, your worship, your tithes, your offerings to a uh, local body of believers in your area. So thank you again so much for watching these and sharing them. God bless you. All right, if you would open your Bibles to the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 24. Gospel according to Matthew chapter 24. I want to encourage you, if you are new to Apologia Church or you're watching this on the internet, I encourage you to go back and listen to, watch the sermons that are previous to this one. It's very important to get that context. We are nearing the end of the Olivet Discourse, so we've been through a lot. We've done a lot of looking at the words themselves, unpacking the original language itself. We've talked about context. We've talked about how the Lord Jesus promises destruction upon that generation and that these things, all of these things, would take place before that generation had all passed away. So we are coming again to the near end of this. So if you are just now getting into this with us, strongly encourage you to go back, spend the time listening to the sermons, really examining all of the relevant texts. So we are in Matthew chapter 24, again, the Olivet Discourse. Jesus on the Mount of Olives. Jesus talking about the Great Tribulation. We've just come out of Jesus talking about the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel. We've talked about Jesus rescuing His people from the destruction of Jerusalem. We've talked about historically the Christians actually fled and went to a town called Pella and were spared, many of them, from the destruction of Jerusalem in fulfillment of really what Jesus describes here. And we are in Matthew 24. Pastor James just did a message last week on the elect, going throughout the Scriptures, talking about that concept of the elect of God, God's choice of a particular people in Jesus Christ for salvation. So we are in now Matthew 24, 23. Hear now the words of the living and the true God. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So if, if they say to you, look, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he's in the inner rooms, 
Do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the, and the ESV says, vultures will gather. Thus far as the reading of God's holy word, let's pray together. Father, we present ourselves before you, Lord, praising you first and foremost as your people for the salvation you've given to us and for this gift of your word. You have spoken. Lord, help me to communicate that today. That you have spoken. That's the anchor. That's the foundation. It's not our emotions. It's not our feelings. It's not someone's mere claims. It's not the signs and the wonders. But it's your word that's the anchor. That's the foundation. Help us, Lord, to understand this passage. Help us to properly understand it and to hear you. Guide this teaching today. Lord, guard me, shepherd of your people, an under-shepherd, from error. Speak and teach, God. Let me decrease in Christ, increase in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Matthew 24, all of a discourse. Quick burst in terms of context. Pastor James was just talking about 1551, Stephanus, and the addition of the, uh, the verses. I, did, I was whispering that, by the way, but I was afraid of him. Um, no, I'm just kidding. It's the shirt, Pastor James. Uh, so, but it's true. A very, very important element of that, I think, just goes well with this right now. The verse um, designations are actually very helpful in terms of referencing all the, all the rest. But we have to be very cautious. So cautious. There are people who say we are a Bible-believing church, right? We believe the Bible's the Word of God. Just the Bible's the Word of God, right? And they'll take and string together so many proof texts that are taken really out of context to develop sort of a foundation for a tradition that they have, that they have embraced, and that they propagate. Now, just because somebody can give you a list of 15 verses, just because somebody can give you proof text, doesn't mean that those proof texts have been properly interpreted or brought into context. It is vital that we actually approach the Word of God with enough reverence for God speaking to us that we handle His Word in a way that is consistent where we let God do the speaking in context. This is so vital for us to get as Christians. There are so many people who are abused by religious people by having them quote proof texts and sort of being weighed down by a false teaching sort of surrounding that proof text. We have to be very cautious. So in Matthew 24, this particular passage is a passage that is used, has been used for ages to abuse people religiously, to abuse people in terms of prophecy. There have been so many generations of Christians who have been abused by Christian leaders and professed Christian leaders through this text. Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, the Olivet Discourse, that's the Synoptic Gospels. You put those together, you'll see the Great Tribulation passage, the Olivet Discourse. And it's vital for us to go to the passage and say, okay, what is the immediate context? What does it say? What is Jesus saying? What do the words mean? Uh, What are these in context? How is Jesus using this? Who is he speaking to? Who's the audience? What relevance is there to this? All of those things matter, but also in the context of all of Scripture. We need to put total Scriptura all together to say, how does this work together in God's entire narrative in His story about history? We need to be consistent and say, what does God say in total about this particular subject? So the Olivet Discourse, the Lord Jesus has now now actually departed. He's now departed and gone to the Mount of Olives. And it's interesting, I pointed out that Yahweh in the Old Testament, before the destruction of the first temple it says that Yahweh's glory departed the temple went over towards the Mount of Olives and rested there now we have the Lord Jesus indicting Jerusalem for their covenant unfaithfulness their sin Uh, there's some very serious indictments of course uh, from 21 through 23 but now we have Yahweh in the flesh departing and now resting on the Mount of Olives, and now he's telling, foretelling, the destruction of the Jewish temple. So there's the context. And Jesus has just, in Matthew 23, 
condemn the religious leadership in Jerusalem. He's been doing that through these uh, chapters leading up. But in 23, he condemns the Jewish leadership in Jerusalem, calls them whitewashed tombs. He uses very strong language. He calls them a brood of vipers. He calls them all the things that the 21st century evangelical Jesus would never do. The meek and mild Jesus doesn't talk like this, but this is how Jesus handles religious abusers and leaders. He confronts them, and we have Jesus, of course, in 23, telling them in 35, so that on you, who? Who's he speaking to? Who's the audience? Us? People today? No, Jesus was speaking to them. He was indicting them, and he says, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of, Ra- blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. And here it is, verse 36. Truly, I say to you, who's he talking to? Us? He's talking to them. He says, all these things will come upon this generation. We're not going to spend time today unpacking the word Ganea, the generation, how it's used throughout the New Testament, through the Gospels, in the Gospel according to Matthew. But I just want to say that we've stressed that this usage here is pretty consistent and it refers to the generation of people then living. So Jesus says all these things are going to come upon this generation. In Luke's Gospel, we have the Lord Jesus saying, these are the days of vengeance. What days? the days that he is in, the days of the people, generation he's speaking to. These are the days of vengeance in order that all that has been written may be fulfilled. Jesus promised judgment upon that generation. Specific local judgment, verse 37 of 23. Again, just an update today. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you, you were not willing. Who? The Jewish leadership. See, your house is left to you desolate. So Jesus now indicts the covenant breakers. He's indicting the leadership in Jerusalem. And now he departs Mount of Olives. He sits on the Mount of Olives. But notice in chapter 24, as it begins, context here is key. He just indicted the leadership. He departs now. He goes over to the Mount of Olives. And you see, of course, this moment where he leaves the temple, verse 1, and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. Think about the context. He just gave them an indictment. Your house has left you desolate. All these things upon this generation... And now the disciples are saying, look, but look at this amazing edifice. Look at this thing. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful, right? It, when the sun shines on it, it looks like a star glowing in the distance on the land. It's an amazing thing. And Jesus says, he answers them, verse 2, you see all these things, do you not? Truly, I say to you, truly, truly, I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. We've talked about how in that very generation... 70 A.D. was the final destruction of the Jewish temple. That prophecy the Lord Jesus gave was fulfilled. The temple was taken apart, stone off of stone, exactly as Jesus promised it. But notice that the context here, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, blood of the righteous upon this generation, you, your house left to you desolate, the context is very local. The context is Jerusalem. We have a very local judgment happening to the degree that in verse 16 of 24, when Jesus refers to the abomination of desolation, verse 16, it says, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. That's a local judgment. If you're in Judea, flee to the mountains. The early Christians, of course, did that. We have uh, the writings of Eusebius we referred to, early church father, bishop, pastor, who actually, when unpacking Matthew 24, he refers to the fact that they had a prophecy vouchsafed by holy men, Scripture, that told the early Christians to flee, and they did. They fled to a town called Pella. In the other Synoptic Gospel version of the Olivet Discourse, Luke's version of this text, he doesn't say the words in the same way Matthew does. He says, instead of abomination of desolation, he says, help for the Gentiles, he says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, flee 
The early Christians did exactly that. First century fulfillment, that generation, in fulfillment of all that Jesus had told them. He warns them, don't go back, flee Judea, don't go back, cloak, don't do it. Just flee the city. Nursing, babies, winter, Sabbath. Sabbath, very Jewish context. Jesus tells his people, look, when you see these things taking place, leave immediately. And, of course, we know from history that Christians did flee the city and they avoided the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, here we go. Just a quick thing in terms of, again, a burst. Remember that I've been stressing that the Great Tribulation and all of a discourse passage doesn't drop out of the sky as a novelty for the New Testament faith. What have we talked about? We talked about how the Old Testament told us about a new covenant that was coming. A new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31. Ezekiel 36. A new covenant God was going to make, not like the old one, a new one where He puts His law within His people. Something new was going to take place. There was going to be the age of the Messiah, the age of the new covenant. But God warns His people through prophecy in the Old Testament, long before Jesus comes, that there is going to be punishment, covenant sanctions, upon the covenant breakers. We talked about Deuteronomy 28. And God, as He makes a covenant with His people, He tells them, I will give you blessings if you obey. Here's the amazing blessings. And then He tells them, and I'll give you curses. Here's the curses of the covenants when you disobey. We went through some of those covenant sanctions and we talked about the fact that some of the warnings about covenant sanctions actually go to famine and go to even eating your own children as a covenant sanction, a warning that it's going to be so bad that you'll eat your own children. We talked about how in the destruction of Jerusalem, those things took place. The famine was horrific. There were so many crosses and dead bodies. It was like a forest of crosses outside of Jerusalem. We talked about blood throughout the streets. We talked about records that Josephus even has of, of people eating their own children. The covenant sanctions fell upon that generation. But more important is that God says that when Messiah comes in His kingdom, Malachi 3, Malachi 4, Isaiah 65, that God was going to bring about salvation. We've got that part down. But He also warned there was going to be judgments. Messiah's coming would come with two things, salvation and judgment. Salvation and judgment upon the covenant breakers. I encourage you to go back and look at those passages to see exactly that promise. Now, as you get into Matthew 24, you'll also see, of course we mentioned it, that Jesus refers in verse 15 to the abomination of desolation. We've unpacked this. Go back and look at those studies on Daniel. We did a little bit of Daniel 9 and talked about the passage that Jesus was referencing. Now I want to note here a very important thing about that passage. Pastor James had a recent debate, I mentioned this before, with a man who has fallen into apostasy and uh, name is uh, Lee Baker. And one of the things that he tried to say was... Uh, I said, the abomination of desolation, Christians say that that's Jesus and it's a prophecy of his coming and, you know, all the rest. But um, how come the New Testament doesn't mention it? We don't have the New Testament writers mentioning that. Interesting thing, Matthew 24, who mentions it? Jesus, abomination of desolation. What's that from? Daniel chapter 9. Lo and behold, that's also the passage from Daniel that speaks about the Messiah coming to make an end of sin to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and it says the Messiah would be cut off and have nothing, and then the second Jewish temple would be destroyed. Isn't it interesting that when Jesus the Messiah enters in, in these chapters he talks about his death that's about to take place in Jerusalem, and his going to Jerusalem, I should say, and he talks about the fact that the temple is going to be destroyed, and mentions, of course, the abomination of desolation from Daniel chapter 9. Very important, but I just want to point out this very important thing. In the very passage where the Lord Jesus talks about great tribulation upon that generation, in the very passage where Jesus talks about their house left to them desolate, He describes the destruction of the Jewish temple. 
Now, when you look at Daniel chapter 9, Daniel 9 says, as a timeline, Messiah comes, here's the purposes, atonement is a part of that, the Messiah is cut off and has nothing, and then it says that the destruction of the second temple occurs. That's precisely what Jesus is describing here in Matthew chapter 24, the destruction of the second Jewish temple. This is all part of God's complete narrative. And the glory of this, and this gets to the issue of prophets today, is that Scripture is clear. God is sovereign. Amen? Now, I know we're Calvinists now, but don't ever lose sight of that. Don't ever get sort of jaded to that truth. He's sovereign. And the amazing, unique, and I say unique very purposely, the unique aspect of this revelation in history is that God actually lays down as a test that he's the sovereign. In Isaiah, the, the test, uh, the, the, the calling out of the false gods, God actually says this. He says, I'll tell you the future before it happens, and I'll tell you the past and why it happened the way that it did. Because God wields all of history. He can tell you what occurred even in the past and its purpose. That's how sovereign our God is. But in terms of prophecy, Scripture teaches us in Deuteronomy chapter 18, 20 through 22, one of the tests of a prophet is if they try to tell you the future before it happens and they fail even one time, they are, according to God's own standard here as a living sovereign God, a false prophet. That's a unique claim to Scripture. Because God is sovereign, this revelation that spans hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years and multiple authors and different locations, this revelation is filled with prophecy about the future. And think about what God says. You want to know if somebody is not from me? If they're not from the true and living God? If they're a false prophet? If they give you one false prophecy? That is how you know they are not speaking for the true and living God. Because God controls the future. He wields the future. He is sovereign over every single detail. Every detail of my life and yours in Jesus Christ has meaning, has purpose. From the glories and the gardens to the deserts and the sufferings. All of it has purpose. But God gives prophecy. Prophecy about the future controls all of history. So I often say, if you want to uh, take the legs off the Bible, I challenge you, find a single false prophecy in the entire Bible. According to God's own standards, there can be no false prophecy. God is sovereign. Now, what's powerful is that Jesus now, after describing the end... Uh, as uh, the end of the age, um, that is not the end of the cosmos, not the physical world, the end of the age, Jesus finishes, listen closely, He finishes this discussion with this in Matthew 24, verse 34, after the discussion of the tribulation of those days, the sun being darkened, the moon turned to blood, the powers of the heavens shaken, all those things, Jesus says this, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Some people have tried to suggest that what we should do, because their eschatology doesn't fit into the passage correctly, we should say maybe some of this is fulfilled in that generation, and some of it is off to some other generation. Like the stars haven't fallen from the heavens yet, so you know apparently that's future to us. Well, the problem is is that Jesus caps this off with what? All these things, including what? Abomination of desolation, including the sun, the stars, the moon, including the powers of the heavens. All those things are contained in the this generation, all these things. And we're going to get, of course, into the sun being darkened and all those things. And Jesus quoting from Isaiah 13, something that God said before about pagan nations. It's the way that God speaks about judgment and destruction. But note that cap on the end of this. Very important. Because what I want to argue from the text is that Jesus promised that generation these judgments. He promised that generation these sanctions. 
He promised that generation desolation, and he promised that generation all of these things, from the difficulties, the persecutions, to even the false messiahs and false prophets. What I'm arguing is that Jesus made these promises about what would befall them, and they happened on time and as planned. And so to the text now, 24, 23 through 26, I'm not doing all that today, just this first section here. Then if anyone says to you, verse 23, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is. Do not believe it. For false messiahs, false Christs, and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Quick thing. Before this, Jesus says that generation. After this, Jesus says this is encompassed in that generation. The ones he was speaking to. His audience in that day. And so the question we have to ask is, were there false messiahs and false prophets plaguing that generation? And the answer is yes. And I'm going to demonstrate that today from Scripture and from history. But I want to talk just briefly. False Messiah, I think, is self-explanatory, right? An anointed one. Someone claiming to be Messiah. The same role or typical role uh, close to what Jesus was claiming about himself. But also false prophets. When we talk about prophets in Scripture, I'm going to say two categories here just very briefly. You can have two ways somebody's a prophet. One, you can have somebody who is a prophet by means of four telling foretelling in other words a prophet in terms of how i just described it right in other words someone says thus saith the lord before this generation all passes away a temple will be built in jackson county missouri <laughs> who said that that's the mormon prophets right they said that that generation would build a temple god's temple jackson county missouri before that generation all passed away failed prophecy right that Jesus Christ is going to return in that generation, in the 19th century, that would be an example of prophecy, right? For telling, this is going to happen in this many years. This will take place in your life, thus saith the Lord. There's a version of prophets, someone who foretells, tells you beforehand. Another way you can speak about prophets in Scripture is somebody who forth tells. In other words, somebody who is saying, God says to you this. Someone receiving divine revelation, giving words from God. That's somebody who could be seen as a prophet of God. So you have Old Testament prophets that may not give you a foretelling, right? This is what's going to occur in the future. But they're still operating as a prophet in terms of their foretelling. From God, he says this to you. So there's two aspects of prophets, foretelling and forthtelling. So Jesus says there's going to be false messiahs and false prophets. Well, let's go to the New Testament record, which I think is the most important thing to do, because they were living in the generation Jesus described would experience these things. So let's look at the New Testament record. This is not an exhaustive Look at this today. Let's just take a smattering of verses. Just go back and check them out later in terms of what was the experience of that generation of Christians and believers in terms of what Jesus promised would occur to them. Quickly go to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. And start in verse 9. Acts chapter 8, verse 9. But there was a man named Simon. Turns out Simon's actually famous in history, right? But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time, he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. 
Now when the apostles of Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. He offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, nor is your heart For your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. So just note that section. Now, that was Acts chapter 8. Another section I want you to pay attention to, if you would, is 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm pointing to this particular one because I think it's valuable for us beyond this message in terms of our evangelism and outreach to the cults. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Some of you guys are very familiar with this. You start with um, verse 3. But I'm afraid, the Apostle Paul says, that... As the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. What's that mean? Saying if this person comes and preaches another Christ, another gospel, another spirit, he says, you might even put up with them. You might even allow it. And he says this. Indeed, I consider that I am not in the least inferior to these super apostles. Even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way, we have made this plain to you in all these things. So the Apostle Paul here is dealing in the first century with, of course, other Jesuses, other spirits, other gospels, and he's worried about the church and these, quote, super apostles and the effect they're having on the believers. Look again at 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter. Chapter 2. Chapter 2, in verses 1 through 3, Peter, in that generation, says, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teaching among you. You will secretly bring in, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Here the Apostle Peter is speaking to Christians living in that generation about what was going to come upon them. And he's warning them about all these false teachers that will bring in all these destructive teachings and heresies. Another example is 1 John. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Again, we're looking at the New Testament record now. Beloved, 1 John 4. 4, one, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. 
this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming in now, in what's coming and now is in the world already. Here's the Apostle John dealing with false prophets, false teachers in his day. Second John verse seven. Move over just a little bit there. Second John verse seven. Again, happening in the generation Jesus had been speaking to. For many deceivers have gone out into the world. Verse 7 again. Those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Reward Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him a greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Here's the Apostle John warning the early Christians. Look, if people are denying these things, that Christ has come in the flesh, God takes on flesh, they're denying this, don't even let him into your house. Now, of course, we got to think about context, right? Because we have people that have abused this verse and have actually said you should never let more missionaries into your house. Why? Because they deny the biblical Jesus. Don't let them into your house, right? Don't let Jehovah's Witnesses into your house. Uh, that's really a demonstration that we need to read the Bible in its context. Where were these early Christians gathering for worship? Where? In their houses. So what is John warning them against? You don't let these false teachers, these deceivers, into your fellowship. Don't let them into your worship. Don't let them into your communion. Nothing to do with your house. We're going to have a real hard time interpreting or living this passage out in terms of, uh, like Dr. Martin said in one of his lectures on this passage, he says no one holds to that consistently when they say it's referring to your actual physical home. Imagine it's 2 o'clock in the morning. The pipes burst and your house is flooding, right? You call the 24-hour plumber. Come rescue me help me he comes to your door you open the door and you say wait do you bring the doctrine of christ or not nobody does that context is key right but again here is john referring to the false teaching that is plaguing the early church there are these false prophets that have ever had arisen in jude one actually there's only one chapter there verse four here's what jude says For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. You can read through this entire passage in Jude the warning about these false teachers. He refers to them in verse 12. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts as they feast with you without fear. Shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. Here's the point I wanted to demonstrate. We can go on and on and on throughout the New Testament record. You have record in the New Testament itself of the early Christians, the apostles dealing with with a whole multitude of false teachers, um, people who were bringing in destructive heresies to the early church, they were plagued with this problem. In 1 Timothy 1.20, in 2 Timothy 2.17, the Apostle Paul refers to two of these um, dangerous teachers by name, Hymenaeus and Philetus, who had actually been claiming that the resurrection had already occurred. So we have that really throughout the New Testament record. But I want to deal with a few historical examples. Jesus says these things are going to be upon that generation. False messiahs and false prophets. Jesus even mentions, he says, if they say, look, he's out in the wilderness, don't go. Hang on to that. Matthew 24, if he's in the wilderness, don't go. This, I thought, would be good to pull from the Jewish Encyclopedia. I was like, you can pull just from Josephus, but I wanted to read this section from the Jewish Encyclopedia in terms of the history that they're referring to. Here is in the the Jewish Encyclopedia, Simon Magus, a person frequently mentioned in the history of primitive Christianity. According to Acts 8, 9, 23, he was greatly feared throughout Samaria on account of his magic powers. But he permitted himself to be baptized and wished to purchase the gift of the Holy Ghost, being cursed by Peter, 
for this presumptuousness. In spite of the definitiveness of the statements regarding him, the historicity of Simon has been doubted by many critics, especially Bauer and his school, of course, who held that he was a caricature of the caricature of the apostles of the Gentiles. Now, as this goes on, I'm not going to read all of this today. He mentions how Clementine, uh, or uh, Christian Clementine Recogniciones, represents Simon as a Jewish magician uh, instead of a Samaritan. Lots of history on this character in history, but here's the point. In the Jewish Encyclopedia. In reality, however, Simon seems at first to have asserted merely that he was a Messiah, though later he claimed that he was a God. Irenaeus actually refers to Simon as well and, quote, says, He was worshipped by many as a God and seemed to himself to be one. For among the Jews he appeared as the Son, thus identifying himself with Jesus, in Samaria as the Father, and among other peoples as the Holy Ghost. Simon is also said to have commanded that a grave be dug for him, from which he was to arise in three days. But this is, it is declared, he did not do. So we have, of course, an example there in history of false Messiah claims within that generation, with actually a very popular teacher in those days. Another example from, again, I thought, good to pull from this, Jewish Encyclopedia. In the first century, from Josephus it appears that in the first century, before the destruction of the temple, a number of false messiahs arose, promising relief from the Roman yoke and finding ready followers. Josephus speaks of them thus, quote, Another body of wicked men also sprung up, cleaner in their hands, but more wicked in their intentions, who destroyed the peace of the city no less than did these murderers, for they were deceivers and deluders of the people. And under pretense of divine illumination, they said God had sent them, were for innovations and changes and prevailed on the multitude to act like madmen. Listen, listen. And went before them in the wilderness pretending that God would there show them signs of liberty, Josephus says. This generation, according to history, was plagued with false messiahs. False messiahs even calling people to join them in the wilderness. What did Jesus warn his people of in that generation? False messiahs false prophets, and if they say to you, look, he's in the wilderness, do not believe them. Josephus is not a Christian. He is not a Christian. He was a Jewish Pharisee in the Roman army, and he experienced what Jesus said was going to happen in that generation, in the destruction of Jerusalem. And as Josephus records the history, isn't it interesting that he even mentions that these false messiahs were calling people to follow them into the wilderness. We could go on. Another example is an Egyptian is said to have gathered together 30,000 adherents whom he summoned to the Mount of Olives opposite Jerusalem, promising that at his command the walls of Jerusalem would fall down and that he and his followers would enter and possess themselves of the city. So, we can go on again. This is not today an exhaustive list. But what have we been trying to demonstrate? That if we actually pay attention to the context, if we let the text itself speak, if we look at it consistently within the narrative of Scripture and God's total revelation, we can see that Jesus promised these things upon that generation. He promised there would be false messiahs. He had said false prophets, and that is what took place. Did it happen? Yes. Was it fulfilled? Absolutely. Now, here's what I wanted to focus on the most today. is I think it's easy to demonstrate from the New Testament record in history that they were plagued with false prophets and false messiahs. That occurred. Fulfillment of prophecy. Absolutely. But I think there's something more important pastorally that I need to deal with for the people of God, and that is to provide a firm foundation. Now, we have many people, even today, claiming to be Messiah. People claiming to be prophets from God. People doing, listen closely, we know that it occurs. 
signs and wonders. I actually was in Kauai. And um, it was an amazing experience, actually. I was in Kauai uh, for our mission out there. And we had a day where we can go to the beach. And I'm at the beach and I look, as I'm in the water, I look and I see, that looks like Todd White. That looks like Todd White. So I'm in there. Next thing you know, this little girl streams up to me. She starts talking to me. And she start, I'm realizing that she's, you know, she's saying some things about Jesus. And I'm like, huh. And so I said, is that your dad? She says, yeah. I said, is that Todd White? She says, yeah, that's Todd White. You know my dad? I was like, I know your dad. <laughs> and so I got to meet Todd White. Todd White's one of those guys today that goes about, you see him on the internet. These people, there's, he's just one example a person that goes around claiming to, uh, you know, grow people's legs back completely to heal them on the spot. Signs and wonders, miraculous events. We have all these examples of all the charlatans over the last generation of our own lives of people who build entire, quote, ministries upon the signs and the wonders and the spiritual and the miraculous. And so the question is, how do we face these things down as God's people? Because it's not a new conflict. It's a conflict that has honestly plagued God's people since the very beginning. The question is, how do I know what is true? How do I know somebody is speaking from God? That's what we have to ask. Because Jesus warns, look, false messiahs and false prophets are going to come. They're going to have signs and wonders. They're going to do things, if possible, to deceive even the elect. Signs and wonders that seem so real, so much from God. We have to ask those questions. What if someone comes and they produce something that looks like it's truly divine? It looks like we're in the midst of the miraculous at the moment. Raising the dead, people have claimed to do that, you know. Early Mormon history even has examples of claims to the miraculous happening at the hands of Joseph Smith. So we have to ask the question, do we follow somebody because they have a sign and a wonder? And I want to say from Scripture, we know that God's standards teach us. How we're to know something is true. How somebody is from God. So two texts to land on today. Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5. Deuteronomy 18, 20 through 22. I want to say that these people that Jesus was speaking to, when He says signs and wonders, they should have understood that Jesus is the Torah-obeying Jew. He is the righteous one. He knows the law of God. And so when Jesus says they're going to have signs and wonders, if you know the Torah, which we should, it's the law of God and it is good, we should know that in Deuteronomy 13, God has a warning to His people. He says that even if somebody comes and they have, oh, lo and behold, signs and wonders, but they lead you after another God gods which you have not known that's how you know they're a false prophet so even if they have the miraculous even if they're growing people's legs you'll know whether they're from god based upon what they say about god so what was the anchor for deuteronomy 13 follow me here deuteronomy 13 is even if the miraculous is happening and it looks divine The standard is God's previous revelation of Himself. Here's the answer. God has spoken about Himself, about His character, about the future, about His love for His people. God has spoken and God says this, even if the miraculous is happening, but they lead you after a different God, that's how you know they're a false prophet. So what was the standard of Deuteronomy 13? God's previous revelation. The signs and wonders God does use in history. Amen? Yes? Those are, of course, in tandem with His promises. And, of course, they vindicate what God said He was going to accomplish, who this man of God is. But listen, that sign and wonder isn't the foundation. It's not the foundation. It's not intended to be the foundation. God's own self-attesting revelation is the foundation not the sign and wonder. Just consider for a moment, it's happened in history. It's right in the Revelation. When Moses goes before Pharaoh, there's some amazing signs and wonders. The miraculous is happening. And then what occurs? Pharaoh's own crew, his hype men, are throwing out their magic. 
right? I can do that. I can accomplish that wonder. Only there were certain things they couldn't accomplish. Like they don't control nature. So the blood and the water was kind of difficult for them. And of course the flies and all the, you know, all the rest. Like those things they couldn't control. But the point is, is even the demonic can influence and empower in such a way as to actually appear to be divine and a message or voice from God. We have to say, how do we know? Because the sign and wonder, that is not a basis. It is God's previous revelation. Second point, Deuteronomy 18, I mentioned it earlier, 20 through 22, and, you sh- and if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When the prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, and the thing follows not, nor comes to pass, that is the word which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. So the tests are God's previous revelation, and we know from prophecy, a single false prophecy makes you a false prophet. But we also know, this is so critical. I'm going to say this quickly. I threw it in. Actually, before service, I was like, I need to say that. So I actually added it here. I think it's important. Uh, we need to be consistent as Christians. We do. And we need to hold Jesus to the same standard. Amen? It's vital. Atheists pick up on this. Agnostics pick up on it. When people go to attack the Bible and they see Christian traditions that are in conflict with Matthew 24, and they begin using Matthew 24 against Christians to say, hey, you're saying that's future. Jesus said it was for them. So that's false prophecy. It didn't happen. I want to say, if we have an interpretation of Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, if we have a tradition that actually doesn't allow us to let the text speak consistently, we need to do away with the tradition. Any tradition that makes Jesus look like a false prophet needs to go. Amen? It needs to go. Jesus is held to this same standard. Now, a quick thing in terms of consistency in the law. Deuteronomy 13, what's the standard? The sign and wonder? No. No. It's God's previous revelation of himself. In Isaiah 8, 19 through 20, God says this to the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no light in them. In Isaiah's day, what was the test for God's people? It was the law of God, God's own self-disclosure. And God says this, if they don't speak according to this revelation... They don't have any light in them. What's that? They're in darkness. If they don't speak consistently with God's law and his testimony. So what was the foundation for God's people in the Old Testament? It was always God's previous revelation of himself. What is that? God's holy word. That's the standard. Now, when you look at Jesus' ministry, I'll give you two points of contact today just for reference in Matthew 15 and Matthew 19. When Jesus wasn't speaking on his own authority as God incarnate, and he did, and he's allowed to do so, when he was dealing with controversy, he actually confronts, listen, this is key, this is huge, did Jesus believe in the principle of sola scriptura? When he dealt with controversy in his day, what did he point the covenant people to? In Matthew 15, he shows them that one of their traditions is actually conflicting with God's own word. And he says this in Matthew 15. Go read it later. He says, Moses says, but you say. So he takes now, here's God's word, and here's what you're saying. And he says this, thus you invalidate the word of God for the sake of your tradition. How does Jesus test him? He says this, here's what God says. And here's what you're saying. And you're saying your tradition is contradicting God's own revelation. So for Jesus, lo and behold, his standard is the same standard for the people of God that God has always laid down. What is that? That God's word is the reference point. God's word is the standard. Now, this is key. Listen closely. It all comes together here in terms of our practice and methodology. It's so critical. We could say the signs and wonders issue is a, is a very serious issue because people do actually say, I had an experience. I had saw signs and wonders. That's how I know it's true. God says, no, God's word's the standard. Here's where you stand, God's word. Other people could say this, but you know, 
It's the church. The people of God have said, this collection of believers over here, they've said that this is the truth. Now, brothers and sisters, we know that God has worked through His people throughout history. Amen? Yes? We're a confessional church. We believe the Holy Spirit is in His people. God's been sanctifying His church. He uses His church. We're a confessional church. However, this is key, the church is not the pillar and ground of truth. Or the church is not, sorry, the church is not the grounding of truth. It upholds the truth. It upholds the truth. Right? The church itself is not the final authority. And this is key, because in Jesus' day, listen, you had religious authorities and leaders who were saying, but Jesus, this is our tradition. This is the tradition of the elders. And Jesus actually tests their tradition, and he says, the word of God's the standard. You're invalidating God's word because of your tradition. One more point, Matthew 19. In the controversy Jesus was dealing with in his day of the Hillelite and Shemaite marriage controversy, where you had two schools of thought about divorce. One was a divorce cl- uh, clause for any cause, the Hillelite marriage uh, issue, where they were saying you could divorce somebody for any cause. Just give them a certificate of divorce. You don't think she can cook well anymore? Divorce her. She's not as pretty as she used to be? Divorce her. You don't like what she's wearing? Divorce her. Any cause, right? So Jesus, when confronted with this, they say, is it lawful to divorce your wife for any cause? He says, what? What's the scripture say? Go back to the beginning. Right? He made them male and he made them female. Male and female. And they were to come together and become one flesh. And so what does Jesus do in terms of of dealing with that controversy in his day? He goes back to the word of God and says, from the beginning, it says this. Here's the standard. For Jesus, that was it. Now you have, of course, a reason why I'm saying this in terms of signs and wonders, messiahs, false prophets. What should have been the standard and the test for them? It was always the Word of God, God's previous revelation. You see, Jesus applied the law of God with controversies in His day, even, watch, spiritual. Church held controversies, traditions of the church, right? These are our traditions from the church. These are from people who revere God. These are Jews. They believe in God. These are the religious authorities. And Jesus says, no, your tradition contradicts Scripture. So you're wrong. You're wrong. But you also have a reason for this in terms of modern-day controversies. Just a quick side note here. Some of you guys may have heard my discussion with Andy Stanley on the Unbelievable Radio program. He is, um, he is uh, suggesting that Christians need to unhitch from the Old Testament And, of course, in his apologetic methodology, there's a lot of confusion. So we have that debate. It's up online for you guys, radio debate. You guys can can watch that. It's on our channel and on Unbelievable's channel. But this actually goes down to the same issue. My discussion with him was really about the same issue. How do you know something's true? What's the grounding for truth? Is it in the sign and wonder? Andy Stanley was suggesting and is suggesting, propagating the idea that Really, the truthfulness of Christianity rests on the resurrection of Jesus. That sign, that wonder, that miraculous event is the basis on which we should argue for the truthfulness of Christianity. And what I was arguing is that's a significant error, philosophically speaking, epistemologically speaking, and most importantly, biblically speaking. That is not how the Bible tells us to ground truth in the miraculous event. And you do see Scripture actually argues against such a notion. I'll give you an example and just point you to the text. The rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16. The rich man and Lazarus is an example of the miraculous requested. And Scripture has an answer in terms of whether that is an appropriate thing to ground something in. In Luke 16, it's in verse 27 through 31. I'll read it to you. Again, you can go to it later to get to more details. The rich man and Lazarus, you know the story. Rich man is in Hades, he's in torment. Lazarus is in paradise, chilling, 
And verse 27, and he said, then I beg you, father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers so that they may, he may warn them, lest they also come to this, into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. So the miraculous, give them a sign, give them a wonder. What's, what's the story? They've got Moses and the prophets, right? And here's the final word. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. The word of God is the grounding of the truth. God's self-attesting revelation. The miraculous is amazing. It's powerful. We're not diminishing the glory of the resurrection of Jesus Christ as an historical event that can be demonstrated. That's not what we're saying. We're saying scripture says the grounding is in God's revelation, not the sign and the wonder. The word is this. If they're not going to listen to Moses and the prophets, they're not going to be convinced that someone rises again from the dead. Now, an example of um, this taking place in history is in Matthew 28, 16 through 18. It's an amazing section. I won't read it now. Just go there later. It's really astonishing. Right? You have some believers seeing Jesus now alive from the dead and they have the proper response. They fall down and they worship Jesus. Worship him because he's God. Amen? Yes? There's an example of, is Jesus God? Well, they worshiped him and Jesus wasn't like, stop. Right? They worshiped him. But then it says in that same passage, while some believers' proper response to the resurrection is worship Jesus, it says, some doubted. Here's... Jesus, alive from the dead after being crucified, raised and walking around, people worshipped him and some were like, nah, I'm not so sure, I don't know. I'm not sure, right? So there's the sign and the wonder, right? But they doubt. And here's my point. On the road to Emmaus in Luke 24, 24 through 26, Jesus chastises people who are now going, oh, we thought he was the Messiah. Jesus is walking alongside them, right? Alive from the dead. And they're like, we thought he was the Messiah and all those things took place. Where were you at? You don't know what's going on with this Jesus. We thought he was the Messiah and he was crucified. And what does Jesus do? He chastises them. Slow of heart to believe what? All that scripture had promised. So Jesus chastising them was that they did not believe and trust in what God had promised was going to occur. So what's Jesus doing? He's pointing them back to God's own self-disclosure, back to God's own revelation as a standard, and saying, you should have known. He chastises them for what? Not believing what God said. And then the most epic Bible study in history took place where Jesus takes them from Genesis to the end and shows them all the places the Old Testament spoke of Him. Quick thing here on the apostolic witness. What was the standard for the apostles? Of course, you see consistently in the New Testament Revelation, the apostles constantly using, what does the Scripture say? What does the Scripture say? This prophet says. What does the Scripture say? So when, they're, when Paul specifically, listen close to this, when Paul is actually defending or uh, he's, he's giving us this systematic explanation of the gospel that he preaches, what does he do to ground his systematic, systematic explanation of the gospel. He grounds it by saying, what does the scripture say? What does the scripture say? God says that's the standard. Next, of course, you know the story of the Bereans. That bookstore is closed now. Do they exist anymore? I don't know. I hope not. Um, but the Bereans in Acts 17, 11, you know the story, right? Scripture gives a... It gives a remark about these believers and says they are more noble-minded than the ones in Thessalonica because when they heard the word from Paul, it says that they did what? Searched the scriptures, what? Daily to see if what he was saying was so. So there's a compliment. More noble-minded than the ones in Thessalonica because when Paul is teaching them, they're searching the scriptures to see, all right, let me see if what Paul is saying is right. There's the standard. Another example, of course, is the thing I mentioned a couple times in the last month. In 1 Corinthians 4, 6, I believe Paul actually there is reciting an early 
Christian creed about Scripture that sounds so familiar to Sola Scriptura. Scripture alone is the sole infallible rule of faith and practice for the church. Paul says early on in the history of the church, 1 Corinthians 4, 6, he says that you might learn from me the saying, from us the saying, not to go beyond that which is written. Not to go beyond that which is written. So for the early church, the Apostle Paul was saying, this is the standard, don't go beyond that which is written. So as Christians, as we face a section of Scripture like Matthew 24, final words here. Question, did it happen? Yes. Do we have evidence in the New Testament? Yes. Do we have evidence outside of Scripture? Yes. Did Jesus keep His word? Yes. But the greater lesson, I think, for the people of God as you approach an issue like false messiahs, false prophets, is how do we know? And the answer from Scripture is always God's own self-attesting revelation. God's Word is the ultimate standard. It's the place that we stand on. Now watch, this flows throughout our lives. You're going you're gonna to appeal to this principle tonight. You're going to appeal to it tomorrow. You're going to appeal to it in conflict with the cults when they drive by you or come to your door. You're going to appeal to it in conflict in terms of theological discussions. How do I know something's true? Oftentimes people will say things like, we need to go back to the early church fathers. We need to see what they said about something. Whatever they believed, that's the truth. Um, you're going to have problems because there were some church fathers that said some weird things. Also, we have to be cautious when we look to the early church. I like to say that the early church was in its earliness. We say church fathers. It might be better to call them church infants. I've said often that I would much rather go into a debate about the Trinity with a 21st century Christian with all of the history of our debates behind us and our dealing with controversies and heresies. Because listen, if you, let's say, for example, if you look at the robust, comprehensive defense of the Trinity done by Pastor James and um, Dr. Brown uh, on a television show years ago here, if you listen to their defense of the Trinity, their clear explanation of the Trinity, their use of the Scriptures... And you compare that to, say, a second century Christian defending the Trinity, I'll take Dr. Brown and Dr. White any day. Why? Praise God, he sanctifies his church. Praise God, he equips his church. Praise God, he uses his word to build up his church, and he allows heretics, false teachers, false messiahs, false prophets to at times plague the church so we can use the Word of God to cast down their arguments. Yes? So we have to be cautious because this principle also will be something that you have to hold on to when we're dealing with controversies, say, about the issue of baptism. Or we're dealing with controversies uh, about other Christian practices. Do we simply say, go to the early church. Go to the church fathers. What did they believe? The answer is, praise God for the church. Praise God for His Spirit working in the people of God. Praise God for Christian confession. But the standard is not the church. The church is not the authority. The Word of God is the standard. The Word of God is the authority. Somebody might say, this is again in practice of these principles. Somebody might say, yes, but there are things in God's Word that are hard to understand. We need an infallible interpreter. Here's the problem. When you say you have the infallible interpreter, the infallible interpreter becomes the ultimate authority, not the Word of God. The infallible interpreter becomes the standard, not the Word of God. You see, watch this. When you have two standards running alongside one another, one will end up eating up the other one. One will end up eating up the other one. So we need to ask the question, how do I know something is true? And Scripture is very clear. God says. Now here's what's important to get about this. It's not to say, as Peter says. Paul's writing some stuff in his day, and Peter says, unstable men are twisting, distorting 
right? As they do the other scriptures. Paul says some stuff. Peter says, Peter says, Peter. He says, he says some stuff hard to understand, right? It's not to say that everything in scripture is sufficiently clear or easy to understand. There are some things that are very big and lofty and you got to really dig in and understand scripture to say, what exactly is God saying here? But here's the issue. God chastises people for not believing his word. When he chastises the people on the road to Emmaus, what did he say to them? Slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. God spoke. You should know this. Shame on you. God spoke. When somebody says, yes, but we need an infallible interpreter, we need someone over here telling us what God's word says, what are they saying? They're saying that God cannot communicate. As the sovereign, all-powerful God, he cannot communicate to the degree that he doesn't need an infallible interpreter. Now, the amazing thing here, last word here, is the arrogance, is the arrogance when somebody suggests that you need an infallible interpreter, an interpreter alongside Scripture, to tell you exactly what God is saying. What is that person assuming? When they're arguing with you in this discussion about needing an infallible interpreter, they're believing, watch, that what they are saying can be understood clearly and that they don't need an infallible interpreter in the discussion. So apparently they believe that they can be understood, but not God. He needs an infallible interpreter. Do you see the arrogance? It sounds so spiritual, doesn't it? When someone says, oh, but the church... The church is the interpreter. We'll tell you what God says. You can't just have scripture. Look how much conflict and division. People say whatever they want. You need an infallible interpreter to really tell you what God is saying. You know what that sounds like? It sounds so spiritual. It is arrogance. It is arrogant to suggest that God cannot communicate in a way that can be understood by people. It's not to say that all things are exactly on the same level in terms of complexity, but God chastises people for what? Not believing the law and the testimony. The word from Isaiah in 8.20 was this, to the law and to the testimony. If they don't speak according to this word, there is no light in them. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'd bless the words that went out today for your glory. Help us to understand your word. Help us to understand this passage Thank you, Lord, for the gift of your word. We pray that you would bless us as we continue this study and that you would allow what we've learned to cause us to love your word even more and to bring glory to Jesus as we can demonstrate to the world that he kept his promises. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.